Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us both in the virtual digital space as well as the physical space. Uh, my name is Daniel Armanios, and I'll introduce myself first. I'm um, the BT professor and chair of major programs at the Saeed Business School where we're at, and as well as the academic director of the MSc in major program management. And uh, Mark Ventresca, my co-convener on this uh, panel, as well as Harriet and Fatima, will introduce ourselves to begin this panel, not just on the ground, but through the air, what space can teach us about the future of major programs. So Mark, please. Great, thank you. Daniel, thanks, and thanks everyone for joining us both online and also here in the Nelson Mandela Lecture Theater. I'm Mark Ventresca, I'm the faculty here at Said Business School. I'm also a governing body fellow of Wolfson College. Uh, the spirit I think that we've come together in tonight reflects both the research that Daniel and I do independently and increasingly overlapping and really bringing in colleagues like Harriet and Fatima who bring both perspective and expertise of their own. So I basically am an economic sociologist interested in innovation and strategy and the work in space I think for me is something new and we'll hear that as we go on tonight. I'm learning from people like Harriet and like Fatima and Daniel and many others uh, and really glad to open up this conversation as we go on this evening. So Harriet, do you wanna say a quick minute of introduction? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for, for having me here today. Uh, my name is Harriet Brittle. I'm the head of the market intelligence team within the European Space Agency, specifically looking at the telecommunications and integrated applications directorate. And I can tell you a little bit more about what that means. Um, previously, I worked at a startup called Astroscale that was looking at debris removal and in orbit servicing. Again, I'll talk a little bit more about the space segment side of that. Uh, so really interested to bring a space industry perspective to this conversation conversation and also uh, learn about that in the context of major programs. Thank you. That's great. And Fatima? Fatima, yeah. Yeah, can... UAE. Uh, my name is Fatima Al-Hajri. I am uh, EVP at Yasad, uh, satellite service operator based in the UAE. Uh, my responsibility uh, to oversee the technical aspects of various projects uh, with the different clients, uh, government and uh, commercial. And uh, currently, I'm leading the production of our new products, uh, which will serve the land, marine, and the euro, uh, which will be utilized uh, in the upcoming uh, satellite, uh, which will be launched by SpaceX in 2024. Um, I'm holding a bachelor degree, and I'm, um, I'm currently uh, pursuing my, uh, my master from a state business school in the MMDM. Fatima, that's you. great. Whoops, sorry. Thank you. And I think we're all here in the business school in Oxford. Where are you coming from? I know you're coming from a way out. Fatima, where are you based right now? Can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? Ah, yeah. Yeah, um, I'm currently in Abu Dhabi. Yeah, great. Okay. Thank you very much. So we've got a little bit of uh, geographic breadth here going on, and it's late for you, so thank you for joining already. Uh, I think we've had a really good just, you, you get a sense of four kinds of expertise on this call. The, the prompt, the prompt dump through the air, uh, in the air and on the ground, is really reference to the core expertise that Daniel has, that is working and building in major programs and really trying to understand what it means to do large-scale efforts that take many, many years and involve lots of people. And we're gonna to try to make some interesting comparisons between that world and the emerging world that Daniel and his colleagues are curating and the work that we're doing in space economy. This is gonna be an imperfect fit, but hopefully it's gonna be generative, and so we'll look forward to hearing from you all as we go ahead. Daniel, how about you tell us a little bit about what are major programs and why do we think there's some useful comparisons or, or activities there? No, I appreciate it, Mark, and I'll say that um Part of why we decided to convene this conversation is in fact this bit of the imperfection. There's some slippages that are really allow for some, hopefully some generative formative ideas. I think we decided to convene this conversation because I see where the trends in space are going are very similar to what we see the trends generally in, in major programs uh, or major projects, depending who you talk to. Um, historically, the thinking has been while multi-organizational, uh, major programs tend to be, or the view is tend to be scaled at a centralized site. So you can think of um, major programming, uh, major programs equaling mega project, right? So you're thinking bridge systems, building systems, uh, kind of traditional infrastructure, perhaps even um, 
IT infrastructure that's kind of centralized on a site. And I think what's happening now, increasingly, not just in infrastructure, but in the kind of emerging major programs like we see in the space economy, like we see in cloud computing, distributed renewable energy, is that it's becoming more distributed and decentralized. And so what that means is it requires a very different kind of coordination, a very different kind of things that used to be taken for granted that I know what everyone's doing in the project, the skills are now widely flung across physical space, so it's harder. Who's been missing in those projects, especially as governments in both the space economy and in major programs are demanding more impact assessment, benefits realization, and the like. And then also the nature of the disruptions, how they're gonna affect different places in different parts. And so, as an example, I was really fascinated by space. I mean, it's, it's a very interesting coordination of collective resources. I mean, take a very basic example. You're, you even have an intelligence satellite. On one hand, you don't want everyone to know where your location is, but if you don't, you're gonna crash into other satellites. How do you coordinate that kind of thing where every satellite has their own purpose, their own need, at the same time, has to coordinate around the geospatial orbits they're, they're frequenting? So I think this kind of idea of decentralized distributed is really a, a push to the, to, the, to the fore here. And I think that's what got me interested, and I'm excited to see what Fatima and, and Harriet tell us about how that informs their thinking around space economy. That's great. Dan, can I ask you one more thing? You, you've painted a really interesting and provocative picture of the way major programs are changing. Decentralized, distributed, many kinds of actors involved. Are, are there, is there an example that you can give us in a minute just that helps us understand that kind of issue? I know you've done work in many parts of the world. Just a case or an example that could be helpful. In terms of the space economy or just no, in, in terms of the major programs? In, in major general. programs. Um, in fact, funny enough, I will bring up one in space. I was talking actually to Harry earlier. Some of my first work was the following kind of puzzle, which was in a lot of parts of the global south, we want to be able to measure the resources on the ground in Earth. And the problem is, is that it's really hard to get reliable ground data regularly, especially in some areas where you know, they can, government, government agencies will always be outbid by industry and others who can pay more for that. And so one of the questions is, how do you help countries that can't measure regularly water, water on the ground, how can they do it more frequently? And so what we did was, we actually looked at whether we can do it all from space with satellite data at the time. This was around 2014, the early days of this. And to kind of get the sense of decentralized distributed, it turns out that you need four or five different satellite systems to measure different parts of water. So for example, for um, the area we were looking at in Tanzania in the tropics, you need to use, uh, for example, NASA satellites like a tra tropical rainfall, rainfall measuring mission. So that's one set of satellites. It turns out for evapotranspiration, you need a lot of radiation-based satellites. And then even for soil moisture, you need to use satellites like as GRACE and others that detect gravitational pull um, within land to kind of tease out what is it about water that changes. And so right there, you already have three or four different satellites that somehow have to coordinate <laughs> to give you a uh, runoff. And it turned out it wasn't a, a trivial task, but it gives you a flavor of the kind of things now that has to happen. Thank you, that's great. Yeah, they're, they're high stress environments. I wanna turn to uh, Fatima for a minute and dig a little deeper on some of the issues that Daniel raised around coordination. So just to remind everyone, these are objects in space that come from countries, from individuals, and from companies. In other words, it's a heterogeneous group of actors and actor types. Uh, all this stuff is flying around at fairly rapid speeds. Uh, and so when we talk about collaboration and coordination, much of that conversation right now has been things that are pretty easy, like the space, uh, the ISS, right? We also know in the last few days, uh, firms are trying to launch their own space, uh, uh, their own uh, uh, space stations. Uh, we know there was an interesting, if failed, initiative a few days ago uh, to land on the moon, a lunar lander by a, comp by a corporation. So the collaboration coordination issues become very rich and tough, really tough in general. So Fatima, could you talk a little bit about your work and your views on these issues? And please yeah, go in whatever direction you like to go, so yeah. Okay, so, so before we think about satellite and launching satellite, we need to make sure that we reserve the slots. So the satellites are actually placed in a specific orbital slot. And the path that we, to make sure that it doesn't interfere with the other satellite and with the adjacent satellite. So this will require a careful pre-launch planning. So to determine the available orbital and the slot that do not conflict with the existing. Once the, uh, the satellite is launched, we can use the thruster in the satellite to maintain 
uh, they're designate, uh, designed orbital slot within a box. So to make sure that it doesn't interfere with the other and doesn't cause any uh, uh, any issues, I mean, in terms of the communication and in terms of also to de-risk it as well. To, to, if we want to, to, uh, to talk about the interference and uh, collusions, so we need to make sure that we, uh, we communicate with the International Telecommunication Union uh, to coordinate these allocations of orbital slots and the, as well as the frequency for the satellite system. What we mean by frequency? We mean the radio frequency. There is each satellite is assigned to a specific slot as well as frequency band. There is C band, there is K band, there is KU band, etc. So we need to make sure that this all has to be coordinated with the ITU to operate within these frequency bands. Why, wh why do we need to do that? This is all to minimize the risk of the interference and to minimize the risk of the debris generation as well. So these radio frequency are used, why? To communicate with the ground station as well. We use it also for the user terminals. By adhering to these protocols and the frequency bands, the satellite system can use the radio spectrum without causing a harmful interference to adjacent satellite. Who is assigning these RF, which is the radio frequency? Again, it's the ITU, the International Telecommunication Union, who, who plays a role in assigning and managing all these RF bands for satellite system uh, on an international global level. Therefore, there is no single satellite operator owns space. So they have to follow the rules and the regulation designed by the ITU. Mm -hmm. A quick question, Fatima. If I'm understanding you correctly, there's both, uh, there's both a stratification by radio frequency. Each satellite is working at its own frequency. And there are also what you call, I think, orbital slots, meaning that yes. there are roadways in space where satellites get um, uh, assigned to, you know, it's kind of like the, the ways that airlines fly at different levels, airplanes fly at different levels. Who's, who's making those rules? I mean, one of the really important claims in this whole area of space economy is that there's minimal uh, governance, there's minimal rules in place. But you're talking about sort of niche or sectors like satellites where there is an assigned orbital slot and there is the radio frequency. Who does that? Who assigns that? Is that convention or consensus or political power or violence or what? How does that happen? Yeah, this is all, uh, we need to file all the requests. We need to file all the, 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 the application through the International Telecommunication Union who, who plays an international, uh, as, as an international level to, to all the countries, to all the yeah. um, private and uh, non-private sector. So everyone has to file uh, application through the ITU to get the acceptance and the approval. Uh, why through ITU? They need to make sure that these doesn't inter uh, this doesn't cause any interference and collusions to others, and also to to prevent us also from the debris uh, generated by other adjacent satellites. Nice. So we need to have some sort of an an organization who do uh, who does all of these. Mm -hmm. Nice, thank you very much, that's really helpful. I'm gonna turn to Harriet for a minute also. Again, some of the same issues. I think what we're talking about right now is one of the, the big questions. Can there be agreed governance arrangements, rules of the game, given the heterogeneity of actors and given the kind of claims making that are going on? Another part of that though is what kind of infrastructure is needed to sustain that? Like, this agency, probably much like ICANN that you're talking about, has come along. Who validates that? What are the logistics for that? We've been talking lately about how, uh, in many ways, many people would say SpaceX, in making recoverable rockets, dramatically increased the efficiency of launch, in turn allowed a lot of companies and countries and people to launch satellites, which has many virtues and many costs. But the question then, and this is something really important, in any kind of technology, there's a set of complementary assets that have to happen. So SpaceX may have given us renewable rockets, but somebody's got to service those satellites once they're up there. Someone's got to refuel them. So there's a whole second commercial iteration going on, logistics, hardware, infrastructure. Harriet, can you speak a little bit to that for us? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
so I'm very happy to touch on some of those points. So firstly, to kind of introduce the space ecosystem, kind of want to break it down into the core components, so maybe this resonates with how you think about major programs, or, or maybe not interested to, to reflect on that. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a number of different aspects of the value chain for, for any space mission or operation. You first start with the manufacturing of the satellites. You then have the launch. You've got to get that into orbit. You then have the operational phase, so keeping uh, those satellites in the right orbital slots, as Fatima referred to. Uh, you also have a ground segment. So we think a lot about space missions and space programs as being in orbit, but there's a huge amount of infrastructure that you need to have on the ground to be able to receive uh, the signals, the messages, and also integrate that into uh, the services that we're providing here on Earth, which then brings you into the final piece, which is it's, it's all very well to have this infrastructure, but you've got to be able to do something useful with it. So what is the service you're providing to your end customer, whether it's Earth observation data, whether it's satellite communications, or whether it's navigation. So we look at each of those different elements, and I really liked what you were saying there in terms of um, some of the themes you're seeing in major programs, and give you a concrete example of a mission that I was... Um, that was in, in development when I was at my previous company, Astroscale, we were launching a demonstration mission to uh, illustrate the technology required to be able to go safely to rendezvous, capture, and safely deorbit a piece of space debris in orbit. Uh, that was a, a demonstration mission that was launched in March 2020, I believe, but I might have that year wrong. It was a satellite that was designed and built in Japan. It was launched out of Kazakhstan and it was licensed and operated out of the UK, and we had ground stations around the world to monitor and receive that signal. So that gives you, you know, if you think about those different elements, the truly international nature of just one satellite demonstration mission. So you think about the scale that we've got going on here. But maybe to counter what you were saying about decentralization, one of the trends that we're seeing in the space industry at the moment is actually verticalization. So, uh, a lot of country, uh, companies or initiatives historically have had a, um, uh, a very um, kind of distributed value chain. You have one company that is building the satellite, another that's launching the satellite, someone else is operating, someone else is providing the ground segment, and someone else is providing the service. But what we're seeing with a lot of companies now, and, and SpaceX is a great example, they build their own satellites, they launch their own satellites, they operate their own satellites, and they provide that service to the end customer as well. So we're really seeing that verticalization, which I think has a lot of benefits but a lot of challenges, and it's really making a difference in terms of how we're operating in, in space. Um, one other thing I just wanted to touch on is uh, Fatima uh, gave us some really good context around uh, geostationary satellites and the orbital slots that we're, we're seeing that are allocated and reserved in a very organized, structured way through the International Telecommunication Union. Um, that is specific to a particular regime of space called geostationary orbit, which is uh, a region about 35,000 kilometers away from the Earth where the rotation of that satellite around the Earth takes 24 hours. So if you look up in the sky, that satellite stays in the same point relative to where you're standing on Earth. Um, but what we've seen over the last decade is a huge surge in the number of satellites that are launching into what we call a low Earth orbit. So instead of 35,000 kilometers away from the Earth, they're now operating at 500 to 1,000 kilometers um, away. That has a number of different uh, benefits and trade-offs, uh, one of which is that you have lower latency, so you have further to travel to get your signal uh, to the satellite and back, um, but it means you have a need to have a lot more satellites to provide a global coverage. So instead of an operator having a fleet of 5, 10, maybe 20 satellites, we're now seeing sat satellite operators that have hundreds, if not thousands, of satellites that they're launching into these low orbital regime. Um, that is not monitored in the same, uh, whilst it's managed from a frequency perspective in the same way through the ITU, it doesn't have the same finite slot um, uh, in the LEO regime as you do in GEO. So that's opening up a whole new set of, of challenges and opportunities when it comes to space traffic management and how do you coordinate in that new environment that we're seeing. Thank you, that's really helpful. Uh, again, I hope we're painting a picture for you that helps you see both the range of complexities and also the differences between major programs and, 
and the space economy. Uh, and I'll, we'll have more to say that in a minute. But I'm, I'm hoping this, you know, everyone's comments are hopingly, I hope they're giving you some flavor for the texture of the issues, the political issues, the strategic issues, and just the complexity of doing things at 10, 1,000 miles outside of the Earth, right? I mean, just the, just the sheer, but I think everyone followed a few days ago the launch, uh, the SpaceX launch of a very, very heavy rocket. And the debate that's gone on, was that a success or a failure, right? So I think it raises these questions of interpretation, what your location is, what you're thinking about, how you see these issues. And that's a, a really central part of this conversation. Daniel, let me come back to you for sort of com comments, transition. Yeah. yeah. No, thanks. And, and thanks, Mark, because the, the conversation, the first part is thinking, how does major programs inform or not uh, the space economy? And, um, and, and I want to keep pulling on that from the other perspective. Now that you see the space economy, what can it inform with major programs? I think Harriet gave us an idea that perhaps the distribution is now internalized within a single company. So even if you have to do this coordination, it's now internalized. And what is the e economics around that? And so I was just thinking in terms of your read of the trends of major programs, what do you think is space economy can challenge or inform on that? So reverse the arrow, if you will. Yeah, thank you, Daniel. That's, that's helpful. Uh, so a couple, a couple of quick opening comments, and then I'll just wrap up briefly so we get time to hear from others as well. Uh, I think that space is something that everyone has always known about, but they knew about it in the sense of I was six years old and I wanted to be an astronaut, or, you know, wow, what are the stars about? This is the long fascination with the stars. I think what we're trying to do here at Oxford is pull together colleagues, researchers, practitioners, experts of various kinds to think about what is the space economy, and I think I'm going to cue on Harriet's point, in many ways, the space economy is anticipating where many large industries and major programs were. There be, the space economy is starting to re-centralize, to re-hierarchize. You know, we've begun to basically see vertically integrated firms. One of the other issues here is that most people have very little memory of what happened in the 60s with space and even before. And, and in some ways, many, many accounts start from uh, 2010 and SpaceX, and I think that's a concern. I think we need to not treat SpaceX as the ER event, uh, and I think once we do that, we begin to free up. Now, the, the con concrete differences that we've heard about from all the four panelists are the space economy is growing enormously in the last 10 years. It's marked by incredible heterogeneity of corporates, uh, political actors, national space agencies, individuals, and various kinds of aspirational groups. Uh, that is yielding a series of conflicts and struggles. For a long time, space was only governed by a couple of fairly thin treaties in 1967, which were written basically to reinforce the dominance of state actors, public sector actors. Uh, fast forward 50 years later, all of a sudden, the, the world is a different world, and space is now full of corporates, venture capitalists, entrepreneurs. And so those early treaties actually don't even speak to the issues. And this is the long, ongoing debates around govern, uh, governance, right? I think the issues there with major firms are who's in charge, of a company, in charge of a project in Malaysia that's being done by a company based in the UK with a, a supply chain that extends around the globe. In other words, I think major programs have always faced, they've been distributed, often with an anchor firm, and then often government support. But many, many uh, worlds there. Our colleagues at Stanford used to write a lot about how any one project on any one construction site, you might have people speaking 12 or 15 different languages, right? You'd have many kinds of occupations. So that kind of complexity has always been a major trend. I think what we're seeing in space is lots of heterogeneity, huge increases in scale, and then I'm going to I'm going to regret saying this, but saying the bubble around venture capital and ventures. Uh, if you track this world, you know that five or so years ago, everyone said SPACs are the solution for space. No one is saying that anymore. There's an enormous amount of money coming in. Much of it, it's unclear the sources of the money. There's also a, an incredible amount of money still coming from state actors, and again, increasingly uh, defense. We'll have a chance in a few minutes to talk about, with everyone to talk about how initiatives that are initially strategic initiatives to, to, make a, to make a satellite workable become potentially offensive weapons or, or insights that let uh, one country or another use that satellite as an offensive weapon. So the dual use questions are important. But I'd, I'd summarize quickly by saying I think space is giving us a fresh start, a fresh way to look at large scale globally coordinated activity not the solutions, but an, a venue, a laboratory to understand those things. I think it 
it matches what Daniel has described in his team around major programs, more complexity, more interest in uh, working with many kinds of local stakeholders and recognizing that that's been undervalued in some of the earlier eras. Uh, another of our colleagues often talks about mega projects. You know, part of the critique that we have of that is they are often centralized with central authority and with the idea that somebody is in control of everything. Uh, I think what Harriet said, there are elements of the space economy that are trending toward that, but for right now, it's been still many space agencies and many firms. Uh, and you know, we could we could show you data on the number of corporates involved, the number of legacy corporates in defense, aer uh, aerospace, and uh, telecoms. We could show you debates on the number of venture capitalists that have dramatically come into this world in the last five years. Uh, you know, so there's there's ferment, which I think raises questions we want to talk about. What are the new forms of governance and alignment possible? What does strategy mean in a world both of decentralized major programs, but also a space economy where when we talk to young people who are in the space world who are 17 or 20, they say, we don't even think about Earth-based industries anymore. That's so 1990s, you know? We don't, we don't even think about Earth-based industries. We're imagining and building space-based industries. And I think those same sensibilities may come through in major programs, yeah. Yeah, and, and Thank you that for Mark, the set of propagations around the just the vast heterogeneity of actors, forms, governance. Um, and we'll go to, to Harry and Fatima. And also, please, for those in the audience as well, please, if you have questions, put them on Menti. We'll get to them uh, quite shortly. But I, I wanted to pull a bit more on this thread that Mark brought up, Harry, which is one thing that struck me by what you were saying as well as Mark and, and Fatima is that you know, when we think of major programs on the ground, we're usually thinking of a project that may deliver, deploy on a collective resource. The actual space of the program is not necessarily collective per se. I mean, there's still someone who owns certain parts of the pipes, et cetera. They may deliver or use a common resource, but they don't necessarily, they're not necessarily in the very, you know, kind of program or project arena. Is, is by definition a collective resource, which is interesting about space, because a lot of what you're deploying, it's already immediately something that's shared. So I'm, I'd be curious how you think that maybe that will force us to rethink how public and private actors coordinate, other actors coordinate. Are they going to always be kind of incompetent? In, you know, there's this kind of, it seems like this almost like frenemy perspective. Like they have to be competitive, but at the same time they do have to coordinate and collaborate. I mean, how do you think that's going to manage with, with this kind of collective common resource you see in space? It's a really interesting dynamic that we see in the space industry at the moment and how that's evolved. And I think Mark touched on that really eloquently. Historically, the space, space endeavors have been institutional and, and government-led, right? You see that um, evolving from, uh, from the, the kind of Cold War era, the, the race to the moon from uh, USSR and, and the US. Um, and since then, we've seen still a very strong element of the space industry is institutionally focused, um, but there is a growing commercial element to that as well. And so we're really seeing that change of how do those actors work together, um, both in terms of providing um, complementary services, um, but also looking at how do they work together on specific programs as well. So maybe give a couple of kind of concrete examples of that. And maybe the first can be on the area of Earth observation. So Earth observation historically has been an area for uh, government or space agency funded missions. Uh, these are uh, large, expensive satellites that you put into space and essentially have a giant camera that points down, takes pictures of the Earth. You can use that for any number of different um, uh, topics, whether it is for uh, uh, monitoring of wildfires, for modeling of water basins, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, you could go on. Um, in the last 10 years or so, we've seen a number of uh, private companies that have come into this area to say, maybe the satellite doesn't need to um, be the size of a bus. Maybe it could be the size of a shoebox. And maybe I don't need to have a huge, expensive camera. Maybe I can use something that is more off the shelf. Um, and so we've had this completely uh, new commercial market uh, evolve uh, in a way that has been traditionally um, institutionally 
led uh, and developed. So there's a really interesting angle there. Um, from the European Space Agency perspective, we kind of look at uh, the development of space exploration from, from two angles. One is understanding what are the institutional areas. So where can a um, intergovernmental space agency um, like ESA uh, work to develop its own missions and, and fast forward on projects where there isn't necessarily the commercial interest or appetite um, at the moment. But we also do a lot of work in partnership with industry where we have industry-led initiatives um, that will, um, we will co-fund, we will work in collaboration with industry on a particular topic or project. Uh, so to give a couple of concrete examples of that, um, on maybe more of the ESA-initiated side, we have launched a program which is called Moonlight, um, which is going to be a public-private partnership, but led by European Space Agency, looking at developing uh, communication and navigation services around the moon. So how do we do that um, with industry, recognising that the future of uh, exploration around the moon has a huge uh, government component, but also we're seeing commercial players, literally two days ago, attempting a landing on the moon. Um, so there's a huge number of different elements that, that come into that um, to think about how those uh, uh, actors work together. And then maybe just to flip back to one of the points you mentioned in terms of physical location being a constraint, because I think that's something that we don't think about in the space sector as much, but is maybe relevant for, for other areas. So uh, in the past, I, uh, when I was looking at space sustainability, um, this is a very new area. There hasn't been much thought in the past about how do we act sustainably in space because we think of it as this infinite resource. But from looking at analogies in the oil and gas sector or um, in the nuclear industry and looking at decommissioning practices and understanding what are the processes you need to undertake if you want to decommission an oil rig, um, we're trying to find analogies for how we could use that to think about sustainability of space systems and what do you do when a satellite reaches the end of its life and how to, how to evolve on that. But one of the real challenges we found there is even an oil rig is on the continental shelf of a particular na nation state, which means they are under the jurisdiction of a particular country's regime. And that is not the same uh, case in space. So we have these new issues and challenges that we have to evolve and adapt to. This is Can I actually just to say space sustainability, that may be a, that's an insider's word. It may mean something different to the others. Could you say, in a sense, by space sustainability, what do you mean? Yeah, yeah so I think the... It's the, not about the green revolution, per se, right? <laughs> I think the concept there is thinking that we've polluted our oceans, we've polluted our atmosphere, we're doing the same thing to space right now as well. And it's one of those things where it's a little bit further away, we don't think about it. But um, uh, when satellites are launched, and we've launched tens of thousands of satellites into space since the, the beginning of the space age. Um, uh, most of those, well, they all have a finite lifetime. And when they run out of fuel, the, the ones that are sufficiently far away from the Earth, they stay in orbit around the Earth because of orbital mechanics. Mm -hmm. But if they're not functioning, that means they can't move out of the way, they can't dodge other objects. So you have this increasing, what I call space junk problem in, in orbit, where we have uh, more failed and malfunctioning satellites in space than we have functioning ones. Um, there are tens of thousands of pieces of debris, depending on how small you go down into the regime. Um, and so when we talk about space sustainability, it's about implying the same environmental concerns and practices that we do on Earth, trying to get away from that throwaway culture and think a bit more about reusability um, and sustainable practices in space. That's really helpful. And that's why I think Fatima's comment earlier about the, the orbit spans or the orbit strata, you know, we, we're filling the sky up with stuff. And sustainability here means how long will, will space be navigable, both low Earth orbit next and then finally into outer space. And it's, a, it's often people refer to the Kessler syndrome. It's not a solved issue in, by any means. So if you're looking for a challenge for your life, space sustainability can be one. Sorry, Daniel, back oh, to you. So of course, this is great. And in fact, what I'm, what I'm struck by all of this is that right. it reminds me of some of the um, kind of even earlier work around some projects around healthcare and others, where it seems like in these cases, the technology as a colleague of our Steve Barley would say, is an occasion to restructure these coordinations. So it's, I've no, I was really struck here when you said kind of um, 
every time there's kind of a new technology breakthrough or even relics of old technologies is forcing an entirely new coordination based on the affordances of the technology. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about this in the context of when we shift to, to Fatima here is, Fatima, is how do we rethink technologies in the context of major programs in the space economy, the kind of new coordination that's needed, even perhaps the new ways to kind of develop the, the, the sectors or which sectors should be involved, how does that kind of generate? What do you see in terms of the technology underlay to this, if you will? Um, I believe we all agree that the space economy is a rapidly growing industry uh, with, with both the private and uh, and public sector entities. Um, they currently, they are investing heavily in space-related activity, which include like, for example, National Space Agency, commercial space um, companies, uh, research institute, university, etc. For example, uh, we're currently working on a satellite communication product to serve both uh, customers, uh, the government and uh, commercial, uh, and also different end customers from different countries with their, uh, within a different uh, footprint. Uh, we are going to serve that, uh, like the land, um, uh, fix, uh, portable, uh, marine, and aero. So, which has the potential to generate significant economics growth and innovation for the UAE space sector. So, if we want to talk about the technology as well, we can say that this is being used in the space sector to enable the coordination across a huge distance. For example, uh, allowing uh, real-time monitoring like the GPS system, which is uh, the network satellite that uh, orbit the Earth, providing location and time, timing information to users uh, on the ground. Also, it has been used to navigate the spacecraft as well, and the landers on the other uh, planets like Mars, for example. Um, um, these, these technology will require a, a high degree of technical expertise and skills, which is, I can see currently, it's like a limiting factor in terms of the decision making, if we want to, to, to touch base on the decision making. And these will need also a coordination um, as these consider becoming like new challenges the current stakeholder increasing because the, the, the investors are also from everywhere. So um, to address these challenges, I can see that we need to develop a new approach to uh, decision making that leverage the benefit of um, decentralizing the technology while also ensuring uh, the effective communication and the coordination within these stakeholders. Um, for example, we can also include the artificial intelligence of this machine learning algorithm to support this kind of decision making and to make it more seamless. Um, also, we can develop a new kind of communication protocols mm -hmm. to enable as well the coordination across different organizations within different countries, within different regimes. So all of this I can see is going to affect the space economy and also um, um, it will play a strong role to, to succeed in the space economy as well uh, by adopting and uh, evolve to the approaches of the decision making if we want to focus on the decision making more. Because, you know, the decision making, we are looking for more experts in the same field. Um, so, so what can I say? Uh, what can I say now? It's we need to. Um, uh, we need to coordinate within different, uh, within different organization and within different countries to make it more seamless for the decision making and to also to develop a new approaches and a protocol for these types of coordination. Oh, thank, thank you, Fatima. And I think to kind of wrap up before I go to our trusty uh, iPad here for, for questions from the audience, I think what's interesting, I'm struck in the evolution of our discussion is that when I even questioning my own biases, I mean, when you think of spectrum and you think of the old analogies to radio, how do you allocate AM, FM, and then you go into broadband thinking of spectrum, what's fascinating about space is it's putting it in kind of in, in really accelerating the change in a couple of ways in terms of you now have to coordinate across different bandwidths. 
Um, the slots may have been preoccupied by something that no longer is usable and functional, it's junk. And at the same time, it's really putting into acute issues things we see also in aviation, which is that um, the, the expertise is not evenly distributed. So government officials are trying to find out how do I assess the quality of something for which I may not fully understand the technical capabilities. The private sector is also looking for what skills can I bring in to kind of help me advance those technologies and build that expertise. So I think we're now getting into a very cross-cutting, cross-band, even where slots are being occupied by things that don't historically exist. And from that, I will kind of, I think we're interesting, uh, hopefully this was just a start for some provocative questions, and we have quite a few here. Um, I'll try to go over them in order. Um, Harriet, um, you were mentioning a trend of vertical integration in the space economy and challenges that are being experienced. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to this a bit more to include kind of any examples of this? Uh, yeah. Can we get a number of questions out yeah, first? Yeah, that's a good idea. Yep. Yeah, just that way we'll I'll hear the questions perfect. that we perfect. can, you know. Yeah. So I'll do, I'll, do, uh, I'll do like, let's say, three or four. Is that cool? Yeah, okay. just a, yeah. So one is the, the vertical integration and what it experiences. Um, another one is um, someone's a senior responsible officer, SRO, for the analytical services program at Sellafield. And so for those of you who may not be familiar with Sellafield, that's where a lot of the nuclear decommissioning is happening. And so we deal in extended program life cycles. How is space framing opportunities over extended program life cycles? So vertical integration, extended life cycles to end of life. And then maybe a, a third question, and then we'll do the next batch. How do you think the space race has changed from 60s to now? How can we protect the peace in space? So vertical integration, extended life cycle decommissioning, uh, races, uh, how has space race changed from the 60s to now? Can we get one or two questions from the group here? Too? Yeah, I think they're all there? putting them in here. Oh, yeah, I oh, think you've so. already put in questions. Okay, yes. sorry. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> all right, okay. I, I can take a stab at the first sure, two, sure. and then I'll d deflect to others. Uh, so, yeah, so the, the examples of an impact of verticalization, right? So I think uh, really the, the impact that you're seeing there is it's having a huge changing impact on traditional satellite companies what they see as uh, the market opportunity going forward. And it's also changing how new business models are emerging, right? So what we've seen a lot over the last, um, let's say decade, five years, decade, is um, rather than companies being um, uh, focusing on their area, you see firstly um, kind of as a service business models, right? So companies will, um, instead of you needing to be an expert in building a satellite or manufacturing a satellite, you can pay a company, uh, you can tell them, right, I want this kind of data to, to come back to me. Uh, they will manage the, the manufacturing, the launch, and the operation, and they will give you the data that you end up uh, needing at the end. So you're leveraging space services without needing to become an expert in the space supply chain. Um, the other challenge that we see is um, uh, what I would see is a, a huge kind of concentration risk in the market. So one of the, the trends that we haven't talked about very much um, is uh, the rise of what we call satellite constellations. So mm -hmm. when I talked about those hundreds, if not thousands, of satellites going into low Earth orbit, that means that, um, you know, I think there's a projection that says about 80% of satellites launched in the next 10 years will be launched by four companies. So we're seeing huge concentration in terms of the infrastructure and the um, platforms that are being built. Large portion of those are being vertically integrated by, I'm going to give you two examples. So SpaceX and Amazon have launched, are launching their own um, constellation initiative called Project Kuiper. Um, that means that traditional satellite uh, manufacturers or components cannot enter into that value chain. So we see this a little bit of a disconnect where we talk about this huge potential and opportunity in the growing space economy, but it's completely closed to most of the traditional space market because it's coming from these uh, emerging operators that are doing everything in-house. So I think that's the main pieces I'd talk about on the verticalization side. And then maybe just to go to the, the comment from, from Sellafield, really interesting in terms of the extended lifetime point, um, because this is something that is a very emerging technology and market opportunity in, in space is what we call in-orbit servicing. Mm -hmm. So really trying to make the most of the asset that you have in orbit rather than um, 
leaving it there and replacing it with something new. So that could be, um, we have uh, emerging companies that are looking at doing satellite refueling, so uh, being able to re refuel your satellite in orbit, uh, be able to do orbital maintenance, so if you do uh, run out of certain capabilities, you can still keep that orbital slot, slot that, that Fatima was talking about. Um, so these are very early in terms of technical maturation, but there's also challenges around uh, commercialising those business opportunities and also the regulator and the policy piece that, that comes with it as well. Um, so we're at very nascent early stages of developing those uh, industries in the space sector as well. I may just uh, make sure. Uh, Fatima, did you want to uh, mention anything on the questions around vertical integration? Uh, the 60s space race to now from your perspective and or the extended life cycle question. I just want to make sure we, we cover across the, the hybrid spectrum. Yeah, I believe um, Harit, uh, she covered everything, especially when, when, she's, uh, when she described how this vertical, uh, I mean, this vertical business started, like uh, she, she described it very well, yes. And, and unfortunately, uh, this is the current market that we are having at this time, yeah. Has that impacted you at, at Yatsat in terms of how you think about, now that you know you're confronted with this verticalization or you're doing it yourself, how does that affect how you work with other organizations with that kind of concentration where to do something, I need to deploy hundreds of satellites at once. You know, it's almost like thinking of drone swarms here in the, in, in the Earth. Like, how, how does that affect um, from your perspective uh, in, in Yatsat? Yeah, Yatsat currently, uh, uh, they are orbiting in the GEO mm. uh, and also the L-band. So we have uh, three satellites. Uh, two of them, they will be close to uh, end of life. So we are planning now to replace both of them. Uh, also, we are launching the, the second one. It will be in the L-band. Uh, L-band, it's a different type of frequency mm -hmm. than the C-band and the KU-band. Uh, which more on the uh, huge bandwidth and uh, broadband data. So um, uh, in terms, maybe I will touch base in terms of the expertise where we need to lay more on the, on the outside uh, expertise from ESA, for example, uh, to support us with their knowledge and with their, um, uh, with their technical uh, detailed expertise in this area. So uh, we are uh, currently also... Uh, supporting like uh, other client in terms of the product. However, uh, we need to work with a Danish company, for example, to, to manufacture our product. So it's still, we need to liaise with the different uh, suppliers. Uh, we are not uh, one entity who's doing from A to Z, from uh, who's doing like um, the space, who's doing the ground, who's doing uh, the product. So um, as uh, Herod described it, uh, it's like space, ground, uh, and, uh, and end customer who is using the service itself, like it kind of a product or it's a bandwidth lease. So uh, uh, I can see this is more than, this is very complex um, in terms of uh, a program, which will need um, each uh, each um, phase from the space itself, uh, multiple uh, expertise and multiple uh, program underneath. So um, currently, I think uh, we cover uh, most of it uh, in a very high level, which I think the audience is happy with uh, in terms of going more in details, like how we calculate this, this frequency, how we calculate the length, uh, the, uh, the link budget, and and the signal from ground to air, um, from ground to space, and vice versa. So uh, yeah, I think that's all from from my side. Yeah, you, you mentioned one thing very quick, uh, just because I know for for those in the in this in the space audience, the LKCU bands will, will make sense. I think you said something that's really important. I think first, if you can walk through for those who may not be affiliated with the kind of space, what is the different bands measure? And I was really struck that it seems like the verticalizations are competing, maybe each is specializing in one band and that's how they're kind of interspersed, the different verticalizations, but maybe walk through what does the different bands allow you to do and what that means, just for an audience who may not understand 
uh, who may not be, not understand, but versed in that from the, from the space background. Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, in summary, there is many different bands. So before deciding on, on the satellite itself, you need to agree on with the ITU with the different band which is going to operate in the satellite. And you need to agree also on the ground station. Uh, when we talk about the ground station, we are talking about the big, huge antenna which is going to receive the signal from the satellite. So you will need to make sure that this is all aligned in terms of the bandwidth. So we have C band, we have KA band, we have KU band, and we have also L band and etc. There are many bands. So in terms of the L band, it's more in terms of the short bandwidth where you, you can use your, your GSM mobile, you can use small data like one MBBS currently or 1.2 MBBS up and down, for example, uh, for, the, for the L band. But when it comes to a broadband, like C band, KU band, and, K, um, and KA band, it's more data rate. So you can go up to 100 MBBS wow. up and down, or you can go more than uh, 150 MBBS up and down for the KA band, mm -hmm. which you can use like for a different type of application and services, like for example, a video conferencing, uh, like uh, voice over IB, like for example, a uh, different type of application that utilize your bandwidth. Thank, thank you, Fatima, for that. Mark, do you want to add anything that you thought would be? Uh, sure, just quickly. That's odd. I'm hearing myself <laughs> echo. Uh, yeah, really three good questions and a lot more I know in the chat. I want to underscore a couple of issues that both Harriet and Fatima mentioned. If you look at this conversation, if you look at the issues, I would say not 1960s to 1990s. I think we can tell that story quickly. I'd say I'd say the 1750s. Let's think about the uh, British East Indies or the, the English British East Indies Company. What happened there in terms of politics, uh, exploitation, uh, mapping the world, bring that up to maybe the late 19th, early 20th century when we had multi modern multinational corporations in the sense that we understand them. So that's a 200 year span of really building infrastructure to go out in the world, the physical world, uh, and the earthbound world and understand. I think the changes then from that sort of settling of the modern multinational into the debates in the 60s until now is instructive for three reasons. We're in a period of ferment and experimentation. Uh, I, I put on my innovation, my innovation and strategy hat. Much of what we know about strategy is based on relatively few cases in relatively developed worlds with relatively stable rule and infrastructure systems. So I think space is an opportunity to really test those assumptions and imagine in new ways. In many ways, if we look at the, the research that Daniel has done, he and others would say major firms are in the same kind of evolution from being dominated by a few large global construction and uh, engineering firms, often subsidized by governments, by state actors of various kinds, or uh, making deals to create physical infrastructure. They're exploring new kinds of issues. They're exploring new formats, new kinds of collaboration. In other words, if we, if we want to believe Daniel's arguments, which I think we do, the world is opening up. Those same mature firms doing major programs worked out of routine risk analysis, safety, and others, they were built out of very familiar tools that had become conventionalized over decades. In many ways, the space industry is, an, is, is in initiating those. They're, this is a time of broad experimentation at every level, from the protocols that, um, that Fatima was talking about, through the kind of business model experimentation that Harriet talked about, to qu broad questions of what is property in space? Who has a right to make claims? What are the ethics of these issues? So I think space is kind of a, is an, a leader anchor for what's possible, how do we begin to think, not in terms of complying with existing rules and using convention, but imagining new rules and building new conventions. And I hope that's something that is interesting. It's relevant to the conversation. Let's think about nuclear decommissioning. Let's think about mineral, deep ocean minerals. Let's think about Antarctica. Let's use the cases that force us to understand space in, in, in exploratory ways. Perfect. We have, we have five minutes. We've been given five minute grace. Um, so I'm going to say kind of, I'm going to, there's quite a few questions, yep. but I'll try to summarize three. Yeah, and then maybe at the end, each of us can have a yep. kind of great. key takeaway. Um, and I'll do it at different levels. One was really interesting about uh, how do we think of valuation. So just a day before, a Japanese startup, iSpace's orbital failed to touch down the moon, and immediately their share price 
decline. So how do you think of future valuation in this space where actually reinventing the possible and even potentially not hitting there, what that could mean for your bottom line? Another one, um, in terms of the space governance regime, one was asking, what does the regime look like for low Earth orbit objects? So it seems like I2, there's the geostationary. What, are, what is the regime that's emerging at low Earth orbit? Is it, is it a conglomeration of, of standards agencies, one? And then finally, uh, one asks, what is the negative consequences of Brexit on EU with space? So what is the, what is, kind of, what is the consequence for the UK spec sector in light of, of Brexit? And then they said, P.S., I love the Apple TV series for all mankind, do you? And so, um, so the three questions are different levels. One is the space regime at low Earth orbit. The second question is how, how are we going to encourage this kind of entrepreneurship innovation when you have to take really big risk and sometimes they don't pan out? What does that mean for valuation in terms of how we think of rethink startups? And then the third one is kind of the consequences of Brexit on the UK spec sector, especially in relation to the EU. Fatima, do you want to? Take those very simple questions first. <laughs> you don't have to. <laughs> Anybody, Fatima or uh, Harriet, Mark? I'm happy to yeah. take a, a quick sure? stab. Okay, sure. Um, I'll answer each of them very quick, quickly and increasingly diplomatically. So uh, the, the first one, valuations. Yeah, really interesting one. Although I will say the space sector can't be the only industry where this is the case, where you have substantial milestones that can have a huge impact on your share price, right? Um, but I think it's a really interesting challenge, actually, that we've seen with a lot of private investment come into the space industry in the last few years. Space companies or space um, infrastructure is typically very capital intensive and has a very long time horizon. VC funding is not necessarily tailored to long-term time horizons. So we start to see this tension and pressure in terms of short-term revenue and actually being able to deliver on those promises that are made in order to meet uh, those funding goals. So there's a really interesting dynamic happening right now in space. Um, and then in terms of the regime for LEO, so the, the ITU frequencies still apply. So you still have to go through the ITU rules to get your licensing for the LEO regime. It's just that the, the orbital slots aren't naturally predetermined in the same way. You know? So if you want to, uh, in GEO, you want to uh, provide services to a certain country in a certain frequency band, it's really only one place you can do it. That's your orbital slot, right? So in, in low Earth orbit, we tend to see a bit more management at a national level, um, where com country companies need to get licenses through their national, um, in the US, for example, it's the, the FCC, um, to operate certain frequency bands over their country. And then they tend to have to get um, uh, requirements or approvals in other jurisdictions as well. So you see much more of a national organizational challenge there. Um, and then in terms of Brexit, so good news, the UK is still part of the European Space Agency. Um, fun, fun fact, um, the, the UK's membership in ESA predates its membership in the EU. Mm. They are separate entities. Mm. Um, so we are still very much part of the European Space Agency and long may that continue. Mm. Great, interesting. Uh, sure, Fatima. Yeah. Fatima, did you want to come in? You look like you had, no? Do you have some no, no, I'm fine. Yeah, okay. Please go ahead. Just, go yeah, very, very quickly, I'll just say uh, some similar issues. I think that the, in, in many ways, the last 10 years, including uh, the uh, tragedies in uh, Turkey and Syria, the war in uh, Ukraine and COVID, have made us all much more aware of supply chains and much more aware of the everyday ways that we build stuff and make things happen in the world. In a sense, we've shifted from beautiful abstractions about money to kind of concrete on the ground activity. I think that's really gonna show up more and more as space moves from being a sector and industry to being an enabling space across all industries. I think we're gonna see an era of experiments, lots of failures, new kinds of issues that are showing up in the examples we've heard from everyone. And I think in some ways that may be the interesting dialogue between major programs and, space, and the space economy is that they're both pioneering work that 
takes on a different flavor in, in major programs, a lot more interested in stakeholders, a lot more interesting in, uh, interest in complex and extreme conditions. And really, if you believe the rhetoric, come in, the language, I should say, if you believe the language coming out of the industry, the, the major programs world, there's you know, 40 years of experts who've built careers in that world, who've really done a lot of insight at every level of financing, coordination, contracts, delivery on the ground, building things. Much of that knowledge may become un, less relevant than it's been as we see major programs that are becoming, how do you bring solar arrays across Africa? Or how, what is China doing in building five million units of solar-based housing? In other words, the scale of projects on the earth are shifting in ways that may make us have to step back from some of the expertise that we've had to date. And I think space is the same way. There, aren't, there are some long-term space experts, but mostly everything that's happening today, as we've said, new protocols, new, new, new rules, new organizational forms, new kinds of governance. And we'll see that work for 20 or 30 years until we begin to build some kind of a routine around that. And at some point, space initiatives may settle, but we're not in that place yet. And so it goes back to the old question here. It said, you know, venture capitalists say, bring me a deal that I can make money on in three years. People are talking about 30 and 50 and 100 years with space. And that's why I go back to the British East India Company. I go back to these earlier moments of exploration, both on the earth and also in the air, to really realize the scale of the challenges that we're going to be dealing with. Oh, thank, thank you, Mark. And maybe to conclude, I'll just ask that we've this is definitely not meant to be the, the, the final word, but actually hopefully an initiating word of, of uh, collaborations and discussions. And so if I may ask all the panelists, if they just want to give one takeaway they, they want to leave the audience with to kind of dig further, maybe I'll start with Harriet, we go to Fatima, and then Mark, and I can say the last bit. Yeah, I think maybe uh, two quick takeaways. One is that space is a unique environment, but as Mark said, you know, it is, uh, we can leverage that environment in the same way that we can leverage other environments as well. So we need to get away from thinking of space in and of it in, in the industry, more as a, this is a platform and a way that we can do business or create opportunities in a new way. Uh, and then the second piece I would, I would try and kind of, kind of uh, emphasize is, uh, I think the space industry uh, can be a little bit guilty of living in a bubble and thinking that it's special and thinking that it's solving problems for the first time, right. when often, particularly around governance, around infrastructure, around project management, there are lots of other industries that face very similar challenges or have overcome these challenges in, in novel and innovative, innovative ways. So I think there's a huge opportunity, um, both for the space sector to lend its experience to other, other areas, but also for the space industry from, to learn from other sectors as well, to see what can be applied uh, to the space regime. Great. Um, yeah. Um, the only takeaway I would like to highlight here is that the space economy is, uh, is a very complex and uh, the collaboration between government, private companies and the international organization is essential to advancing uh, it. So uh, I'm looking for this kind of collaboration really. It is one of the essential for the innovation and for, for helping uh, the, the expertise to be available for all the countries. Great. Yeah, I'll say quickly uh, a theme that you'll all know from if you know me. I think love the technologies that are enabling these advances, never mistake them for actual progress and always realize we have to wrap around those technologies, institutions, cultural and social factors. These are crescive developments that take time to mature. So as exciting as you know, what SpaceX has done, SpaceX has done is, is, or as Fatima said, as exciting as machine learning to customize the delivery of data from satellites, all really interesting, amazingly complex technological challenges. Those never stand alone outside of the social, the political, the institutional, and the cultural. And that's what I want to encourage everyone to pay attention to. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to begin to contribute vocationally through your own professional activities or uh, personally to, to really ask these tough questions, ask the questions about ethics, ask, ask the questions about who's got a place at the table in shaping space policy. Those are the questions that really matter. The technologies are brilliant and amazing, but will never be adequate to solve the issues that we face. I would just say I want to leave with kind of two questions that built exactly from what Mark says about, about 
you know, disentangling of technology and the operational efficiencies from actual progress, strategy, innovation. One, one that came to me was, what I was really struck by is how do you try to shape a governance system where almost on a daily basis, the technology allows you to do new things that you didn't do before? How do you build a governance system that's flexible to changing technology? Um, so, and, and especially when it's across kind of different uh, levels. And then to that level point, what I was really struck by when I first came to this conversation, I was thinking space as a common resource or a collective resource as kind of one entity. What happens when a common or shared resource becomes segmented? So what happens when you have one segment is running on one regime versus another? How do you coordinate around that? So how does, what do you do when you're now having a collective that's really just interrelated different bands of collectives or segments? I think is interesting questions to consider for major, major programs in general. And with that, uh, hopefully you join us further, come reach out to us and engage in this conversation further. Uh, for those online, thank you for joining us. For those in person, uh, we're looking forward to further discussion after. Thank you so much and thanks to, the, to my co-convener Mark, Harriet and Fatima. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you.